then we have the grace and the beauty of it being in conversation with uh, Bill Wiley Kellerman, who is a nonviolent community activist, an author, a teacher, a pastor, a grandfather, a father, <laughs> um, many, many things to many people. Um, Bill Wiley Kellerman is from Detroit, Michigan, um, and has served in a place-based vocation um, for many, many years. He's engaged in nonviolent actions and actively seeks to support um, nonviolent work on the ground um, and across our country. He's been the point person for the Michigan Poor People's Campaign, as well as a graduate of Union Theological Seminary in New York. He has been a contributor to Sojourners Magazine um, and recently published his book, Celebrant's Flame, uh, Daniel Berrigan in Memory and Reflection out of Cascade. It is an honor to be here with you today, Bill, to discuss, yeah, <laughs> uh, to just discuss this work. Um, you've dedicated your life to really not only thinking about, but doing the action of nonviolent work, um, the action of of that's tied to your faith. That's tied for me in witnessing you, it's been tied to your faith, tied to, and I, I think you wrote it somewhere, how Jesus, right? Really the core foundation of Jesus's work and, and the core message of the gospels, right? Is nonviolence. It's good news to the poor. It is actualizing and manifesting the word made flesh. I um, mean, it's deeply liberative power of our renewal through death. And I, I, I get goosebumps when I have read your work, when I've listened to you. Um, and it's just, and this is why I, I want us to have this conversation about what began this relationship to this theology and also how it's connected to your theology of the powers, um, especially since you, I believe, have been a former student of, of Dr. Walter Wink, um, right. but also how it's animated your own work. Um, and I'm, 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 I, I'm, I'm curious how it's, and it's remained in this uh, wonderful, innovative, imaginative and creative spirit, this theology that you have lived in and, and continue to enliven communities with. So I'm curious about this relationship to the theology of the powers, but also how this engagement with nonviolence emerged within your own sort of life history, your life course um, and your ministry. Hmm. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Fernando. I wanna say what a gift it's been to, uh, I haven't made, I think I missed a session, but uh, I've really appreciated the the series that uh, you and the FOR are doing on, on Walter's uh, work, uh, on working through the powers that uh, be. He, he was indeed a, uh, a professor of mine at, at Union Seminary uh, in New York. Um, uh, and that would be spring of 72, uh, New Testament class, but uh, actually, we'd also already been arrested together in the fall uh, as part of the Daily Death Toll Project. A group of Union students joined some 300 others from New York going down to, to D.C. to do a die-in. That was the number of folks, who people who were being killed by the air war in, in, uh, in 71. And... Uh, there were other professors who supported us. They gave us a hundred bucks to, you know, for the bail bond. Uh, but Walter, you know, got on the bus and uh, and was part of the the action. Um, I was thinking uh, just uh, yeah, just moments ago about uh, there was another time we were rested together twice. Another was during probably in the nineties. Early, very early 90s, uh, uh, around the, the Gulf War, uh, again at the White House. And 
while we were waiting to, to get on the bus, uh, you know, we'd been arrested and were lined up. And I was telling him that I was working on a, trying to write a book on liturgical direct action. And I was kind of being stymied and slowed by it. And he said, the powers are trying to prevent that book and you mustn't mm -hmm. let them. Mm -hmm. And that was really sort of a personal, uh, it's like seeing the task of writing itself as a struggle with the powers. And I knew that that was kind of hard won uh, wisdom from his own, own experience mm -hmm. of trying to write about the powers and, uh, and sort of struggling uh, to, to, uh, to bring that kind of forth. Um, that same period uh, when I was at Union, uh, the following year, uh, Dan Berrigan got, was released from uh, Danbury Prison for the uh, action, the draft board, uh, draft files burning action at Catonsville. And he came to Woodstock College, the Jesuit College, and which was right there with Union and affiliated. And uh, so we had courses from him for a year. Um, and when you ask about nonviolence, uh, in some ways that was really my sort of deep dive. We were reading the Book of Revelation, uh, uh, Jacques Ellul mm. uh, at the time. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, and began uh, doing more and more direct action, even there in the city. Um, and he also introduced uh, a group of us uh, to William Stringfellow, mm. uh, who um, was really a, a seminal writer on the principalities and particularly in bringing them, uh, you know, back to earth. <laughs> Mm -hmm. from uh, being projected onto the, onto the cosmos or uh, being kind of off the page in outer space. Uh, he was reading them as institutions and structures and, uh, and his book in 1974, I think, was uh, An Ethic for Christians and Other Aliens in a Strange Land. Mm -hmm. um, and Walter actually began his uh, his own work on the powers, reviewing an earlier book of Stringfellow's, uh, uh, Free and Obedience, uh, which, uh, you know, so they were very much in conversation. Uh, eventually, I was able to be part of a course at Auburn Seminary that they mm -hmm. taught together on the on the powers, and and uh, so. My, the influence of the powers, the theology of the powers really came from both of them. They're, uh, they're very, they're simpatico, they have differences and, mm -hmm. uh, as well. Uh, but over the years, that's uh, informed uh, my, both my approach to, to uh, nonviolent struggle, um, whether it's uh, resisting nuclear weapons, anti-military work, or uh, the Detroit newspaper strike, or the uh, sort of street level struggle against uh, the domestic armaments industry and, and handguns, um, uh, the water struggle here in Detroit, the power, the theology of the powers has, has uh, really helped me frame those struggles and understand them uh, at a deeper level. On the one hand, you know, Wink is so clear that the powers are simultaneously material and spiritual. And yeah. to get that in, uh, in political struggle um, is to understand that on the one hand, there's a a concrete street level bodily engagement uh, of the powers. Um, and, and often I think we're, we find ourselves working in coalition or collaboration with others who have a really strong materialist 
uh, analysis, uh, but are somewhat mystified to say these there's a spiritual dimension, a spiritual struggle uh, at work. And that introduces a whole, whole other variety of uh, tactics, uh, liturgical, cultural, uh, artistic, uh, uh, that uh, really to, to engage the powers, you need, it's really a two-handed uh, struggle. You need to be seen with both eyes yeah. to get the depth. And that's just so it's so challenging because I it's it's interesting that you met uh, you mention the spiritual and the material as as getting to that dimensionality that depthness that I I'm I t I actually we do a case study on Flint Michigan for instance and the water crisis uh -huh. um, to my students in public health and in medicine right and. And it's so materially based. It's so grounded in the evidence-based literature that shows how at all, all steps of the way, how duty bearers did not uphold their responsibilities and obligations to rights holders and mm -hmm. how despite rights holders attempts to hold these duty bearers accountable, still were exposed to, disproportionately exposed to, um, the disease, morbidity, and mortality that actually emerged from right. the water crisis. And, and, and it's been a struggle for me, right, to how do you engage in the spiritual, like the deeply spiritual part of this, in these coalitions that have been so materially driven, that mm -hmm. have been so almost um, atta the attachments to that material that the spiritual dimension and the tactics around that spiritual dimension are, are, are hidden or, you know, they, they, they've been intentionally or unintentionally blanketed or put in the background mm -hmm. or quieted. And, and, and I, this is why I'm curious from you is how, how are, how do we integrate more deeply this, this almost this, this multiple awareness that takes seriously spiritual tactics mm -hmm. in, in what I feel has been such an overarching materialist reality that we're in. Um, how do we not only remember, but engage with, actively engage with that spiritual, that, that spiritual side right. um, as part of this theology of, of engaging with the powers that help us frame this work right deeply, mm. that frame this nonviolent action and the struggle to support our collective liberation, right? And that's, you know, from, you know, as you speak, I'm like, oh, this is one of my challenges, mm -hmm. right? Um, is how, how to re almost rebalance, how are we called to rebalance um, uh, this equation in a way? Right. Uh, and, and I'm curious from your, since you've been at the heart of at least Detroit and Michigan and these challenges that are alive still, in my view, are still alive. I feel like the water Absolutely. crisis is still Absolutely. like ongoing. I don't think it's gone away. If anything, it's it's amplified, right? Mm -hmm. um, and yet it remains still so material to me as a public health professional who's teaching this and teaching this as a case study that I'm trying to keep alive, but reminding my own students and the people who are wanting to be part of these broad coalitions. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think one of the really strong sources uh, that we've been listening to in Detroit and uh, following uh, is the indigenous community, mm. um, which understands uh, water as sacred, as, uh, as a kin, a relation. Um, and I mean, there's certainly that there are strains of that in Christian theology, St. Francis naming Sister Water, you know, is, uh, mm. in the uh, canticle of creation is, you know, is much the same thing. And, and the uh, indigenous community has uh, uh, 
I think uh, they've enacted uh, ceremonially, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, in 2007, uh, uh, two, yeah, 2007, 2010, the U.S. Social Forum came to Detroit. And one of mm -hmm. the important ceremonies was led by the uh, women water walkers who at that time were in the midst of walking the entire shoreline of the Great Lakes, carrying carrying water. That's a that's been a practice uh, that is 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 very common. Uh, uh, indigenous women did it, walk the length of the Potomac, mm. carrying water from the headwaters down to the Chesapeake Bay and pouring the water back in there, they said, so that the river could remember mm. what it tasted like at its beginning. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, wow. And- I got goosebumps with just hearing you say- <laughs> Right, <laughs> exactly. That's, like, that's a brilliant, yeah. that's absolutely brilliant. And, and at the same time, water is being, uh, captured you know what's what's the commons what's what for for christians is the sort of embedded sacramentally in the in baptism of uh, the a sign of grace that falls from heaven right it's a it's a gift it belongs to all it's the commons and so it's the, it's the epitome of the commons and in, to a certain degree still is in the way that land is not, you know, land has been um, uh, privatized, turned into real estate, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and the water is still, there's still a dimension of you can't own a lake, you know, right. you can't own, right. Um, but it is being privatized. The powers are yeah. claiming it, they, pollute it, uh, uh, it's being, yeah, it's being you know, grasped and corrupted and, uh, and claimed, right? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, part of the, part of the struggle, the, the water struggle, uh, is to continue to, to hold it up as a gift in a commons, and, and that's the basis for water as a human right. You know, it belongs right. to all, not just, to, and not even just a human right, but a, a creature right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, all of that. Um, so uh, I think in the, in the Detroit water struggle, the indigenous community has had a role in, in ceremonially um, and in lifting up the, the sanctity of, of, of water uh, in a way that's uh, offered us some clues about uh, how to do liturgical action, you know, uh, resistance in, in terms of the water swimming. Go ahead. No, and I, I, I'm, you know, I, I'm loving this reality of liturgical action because I feel like this is in a way a very um, creative force, uh, you know, I, a creative and imaginative transformative approach that is not only embodied, but it's ritualized. There's like a ritual of, of, of bringing us back into, like our bodies are brought back into this larger ecosystem of the commons, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not even just the commons between you and I and our communities, like human communities, but it is reconnecting us to this larger ecosystem, like God's system, right? The sacred yeah. system that we are part of. Yeah. Um, that is, it's, it, it invites us to come to rebalance from the material and remember the spiritual, the sacred, and I and 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 thank you for reminding me of this as a as a really powerful, uh, transformative force, right? Despite all the challenges that we face, right? That that the action of this liturgical action, right, almost almost arrests the 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 driving force of the powers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that 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 sort of bullets us into in a violent way into this the commodification of things like water or mm -hmm. the privatization of water and in a way 
you know, as I hear you talk, I feel that part of this this transformative work is this liturgical action, right? This 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 engaged. It's a real engaged with our bodies, our minds, our spirits, our 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 emotions, our communities in such an integrative way, mm-hmm. right? That that we participate we we participate in the action, right? That transformative action. You just don't think about it or say it or s- silo it into a variety of actions, but this is the integrate. It's almost a very integrative right. action. It right. feels like that. It, did I, I, I'm like, I'm. I- no, you're right here. You're pinpointing and, and uh, articulating the, the very things that I, I would say is, is crucial. It's particularly one of the gifts that, uh, Christians, faith traditions can be bringing to uh, to struggle, you know, uh, um, uh, working from the, the, the liturgical seasons, yeah. <laughs> acting in accord with those, uh, uh, lifting up the, the significance and the vision, which is included in those uh, and embedded in those. And uh, and in a way, it's 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 a way of also drawing whole communities uh, by implication into the struggle, you know. And it's in that that you know, I think that's one of my challenges too, to remember that in that start, like we were just in the upper room and Holy Saturday, right? And in right. this and and dwelling in that space and in anticipation of what was to come, that we are all, at least in our Christian traditions, um, understand the importance of that liminal space um, toward our own renewal. And and when I think of of engaging in broader coalitions as a Christian, it's to remind myself of that connectivity and that invitation that while we all may not be Christians, right? And, and I was remarking to my students the other day also is that, you know, what after 33 years or so that we have the three great Abrahamic religions, um, sort of Passover, Easter and Ramadan coming to get coalescing together at this point. Yeah. And remembering that, that, that I love how you say our faith traditions can inform, really powerfully inform this work, right? Mm-hmm. How it can help us transform the struggles into liberation, into renewal, right. and a renewal in a different way. Renewal in our relationship with each other, right? This, this, which I I I have loved this ability to witness you and to to hear you and be inspired by you because it's helping me be better at being mm-hmm. a Christian, but it's also helping me engage in the challenging coalitions that I am in, in with, right? Where people disagree or people are, are, are coming at an issue like water or an issue like land or food or housing, any of these issues that we wrestle with mm-hmm. as the, uh, in commons and with our earth, right? With our universe. Right. But it reminds me of how, you know, I think you wrote this in one of your Sojourner's pieces, how Jesus calls us into action, how Jesus invites us into, in the embodiment of the, the Gospels, yeah. like liturgical action means that we can also have this radical hospitality with each other and mm-hmm. with our ecosystem, with our world, yeah. right? God's creation. And that's hard to do, right? That's a really hard thing to do, especially when I'm talking to these, you know, younger people who are in new generations that I'm like, what is it, what does it mean to re-inspirit, right? Mm. And re-inspire and listen to our divine vocations yeah. in spaces where we're so distracted by material, where I witness the the kids I teach profoundly distracted by the material okay. and are are asking me these questions of like, who are your, who do you go to? And I'm like, you need to read Bill Wiley Kellerman. Like you need to, we need to listen to that wisdom. We need to listen to the wisdom of, of First Nations peoples. Mm. We need to, how do we remember our belongingness in this liturgical action that is, that the powers distract us with the material aspects of this work, right? Mm. This, and that in that, 
you know, it's it gets harder for me at least. It's it's been getting harder and harder to engage in these broad coalitions, right? Yeah. In coalitions that are outside of my own echo chambers, hmm. right? Where how do I encounter my enemies in a different way? And not see them as enemies anymore, right? This, this. How do I even shift that, that framework and that reality differently? Mm -hmm. Is there? What is the possibility for me, as I hear you in this work, to actually no longer see the other as enemy and to be afraid, but to walk toward, right? To actually engage in a different, right. in a nonviolent way. And I feel like in this. And our, our faith traditions, especially the tradition I'm from, this Christian tradition, helps us through that, right? If we can get to the core of our teachings in a way, because I feel like sometimes even in the tradition I'm from, we have so much noise that the powers bring into that space. Okay. And, and I'm just curious how as you have navigated from the 70s all the way to now in these nonviolent actions, especially in broad coalitions, which I would imagine would be filled with a number of distractions and disagreements. Yeah. Um, <laughs> do, you know, how have you navigated? Because I have fault lines here, yeah, right? Yeah, right. And 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 I'm curious how how we teach a new generation yeah. work, right? Um last last week, uh Holy Week, um one of the uh, big things that we do in Detroit uh, is on Good Friday to walk the Stations of the Cross through mm. uh, through the city, through downtown. Um, actually, at the beginning of Lent, mm -hmm. we convene this year on Zoom still, uh, but this is the first year we've been able to do the Stations in the last two years, we've been mm. doing them by basically doing them on Zoom. Uh, right. Uh, so it was great, uh, really energizing uh, to be together on the streets again. But at the beginning of Lent, we gather and reflect on uh, where is crucifixion happening today mm. and uh, kind of generate uh, a list of those divvy them up, and then we each, we write meditations on uh, the water struggle or nuclear war or the World Economic Forum coming to Detroit, uh, mm. the war in Ukraine. Uh, uh, so, and then we go to places, uh, carry across to places and read these meditations where crucifixion can be recognized or ministrations of, you know, the cup of cold water uh, offered uh, or the cross carried. Um, and that's a, that's a really powerful uh, tradition for us. We've been doing it 40 years. And, uh, you know, Tom Lumpkin, who was one of the founders of the Detroit Catholic Worker and been doing it for maybe closer to 45 uh, years, you know, is right there at the beat, you know, in the writing the first station about the worker soup kitchen. But the, the worker community itself is all new young people. And I love that. You know, there were five folks for whom this was like a first time uh, of doing this and uh they were they were kind of blown away by it you know and um uh yeah it's a the the entourage the procession was you know folks with white hair and then this mix of of young people even kids on bikes uh being part of it um and we and we end up at the you know back at the church for closing meditation and you know where you're referencing the well but I was I guess on the coalition question many of the stops that we're doing uh, really framing them in terms of the Christian uh, year and the 
and the Good Friday moment are often things that were inv involved in a wider coalition or a wider community of, of struggle, but we're focusing them. Uh, that doesn't mean, well, once in a while, some of the coalition folks will, you know, know that there's going to be a particular stop and, and throw in with us. But in a way, it, it, it uh, focuses and uh, consolidates within our own hearts our faith commitment to this issue and a framing of it that gives us a freedom to, to then be, you know, standing side by side in other contexts uh, uh, with people who, who would actually see the church faith tradition and the church tradition as an imperial tradition, which it indeed has been, you know, used in that way and participated. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think it, it, it frees and enables us. Um, and, and you were mentioning the love of enemies, and I, I, I really think, uh, you know, Jesus uh, on the cross, uh, which he enters into with a, with a kind of freedom, uh, a deep freedom, maybe you could even call it the freedom of the resurrection. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's in the midst of that, he's so concretely loving, <laughs> loving enemies, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, not just sort of up there oozing cosmic love, but loving very concretely, mm -hmm. you know, forgiving, you know, those for, forgiving the centurions on the scene, forgiving. You know the power, the 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 minions of the powers, Pilate and uh, uh, those who had had condemned him. Uh, uh, he's being executed for resisting empire, and at the same time, loving those who are acting in accord with it. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, in a way, the. Paul is really clear in the way in which the powers come to bear in the, in the crucifixion. Um, and, and also how Jesus love so concretely, you know, uh, in that particular instance is how we know and recognize the, the love of God uh, yes. underneath all things, you know, no, in, in which he's participating. Yeah, and 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 in addition to that, I feel that 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 loving concrete that that kind of concrete love also allows us to engage with each other when there's challenges, when we can see the colon the colonizing power or of the church, or where we can see how we may disagree on how we approach tactically um, certain uh, uh, certain issues or or topics, or how we can we can navigate through our 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 collective suffering around any any number of intersectionalities that members of our commons may experience due to aggressive force and violence of the powers, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as you speak of this, it's the, the action of loving concretely at least helps me support how, how we can actually hold each other accountable, support that accountability, right? Nonviolently, right? To be able to encounter each other and be able to say, okay, there may be, these are issues that we face collectively that impinge on each other different way in different ways based on our whatever subject position we may inhabit or dwell. Mm -hmm. But but when we love concretely, we can hold up our, our that action of love to hold us each other, each, each of us accountable to transform, right? The powers that be, right. right? To actually do that redemptive work, at least as a Christian, to do that redemptive work. Um, very uh, on the ground, right? Here in the here mm -hmm. and now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really appreciate not only that message, but that work, right? I feel like you've been doing this work quite a bit. And it, it, it warms my heart that there are younger generations that are actually participating in this work too. I see that mm -hmm. myself in the mm -hmm. work I'm doing.
And it feels also that, you know, this, this, this work is becoming even more important and more significant given the times we're in. Yeah. You know, I feel that, oh my gosh, I feel overwhelmed. I mean, just being here right now in Europe and feeling the edge of, right, this war that is actually quite present in everyone's right. reality. Um, and how that it, it is not so different from the wars that we're seeing on our own soil in the United States, right? This, this the, how we frame um, the violence that we experience in our everyday lives, whether it's the microaggressions that we witness or that we actually experience to the actual atrocities um, that we, that are profoundly violent in our society. Mm -hmm. And that both of these are part of a larger fallenness of the powers that we're encountering. And it feels so huge sometimes and so overwhelming. Um, and when you speak of this and speaking of it through loving concretely in this embodied, in this body embodied work, almost in this embodied ritual and this embodied practice of belong of our engagement with each other. Hmm. While it can be very overwhelming, I feel hope in that. There's like there's a there's that that it broadens my horizon in this space, right? In a space where it's a lot easier to just despair and lament. And even in that lament, it's the, that I feel that I can lament in that space. Mm. If I remind myself of how you frame this, right? How we can love concretely, engage in these emb deeply embodied sacred practices. How do I, as a Christian, remember that liturgical action that you speak of, mm. right? I mean, how do we remind each other of that, right? How do I remind not only people in my faith tradition, but in the encountering in these coalitions that we're part right, of, right. reminding each other of our liturgical actions, right? Broadly defined, right? With right. whatever tradition we come from. I don't know if that makes sense, Bill, but yeah, as you it does. That uh, was what was coming up, you know? Yeah, I was, I was thinking in terms of conversation uh, across those uh, lines of uh, Dan Berrigan's conversation with Thich Nhat Hanh, mm. and been so mindful of, of that, you know, since the beginning of the year and Nhat Hanh's uh, passing. Uh, I know that when Dan was in, in prison, he had, they had a little study group and, and one of the things they, they studied was the, the order, the rules of Nathan's uh, order, the order of inner being. Mm. I think there are 14 uh, principles and, and they attended closely uh, to those. Um, and I was thinking at that at the time, uh, uh, Nathan had he had gone to to Paris to participate in the uh, Paris peace talks or to be at the edge of them, and and because of the campaign that they were doing, and the order was doing the Buddhist engaged Buddhists were doing in, uh, in Vietnam. Uh, they were vilified by both the north and the and the south. You know, mm -hmm. he was exiled by uh, by both. But the campaign they'd been doing was was focused on the notion that war is the enemy. And that's mm -hmm. a that's a principality understanding uh, from a Buddhist standpoint. Maybe uh, war is the enemy. And the campaign was don't shoot your own brother. That was the, mm. the, the slogan. And uh, there was a, an artist uh, by the name of Vo Din, who was, I don't know whether he was actually a member of the order, but very close. And, uh, and he had done uh, some pen and ink drawings that it, uh, illustrated a book of Thich Nhat Hanh's poetry called The Cry of Vietnam. Uh, and there was a two, two uh, 
pieces of art that were companions to one another. The first was two brothers or two uh, human figures, torsos, rising out of the same uh, tree with mm -hmm. roots into the earth, right? And yeah. then it divided and they're both reaching back with, with knives ready to kill the other, you know, not recognizing that they're part of the same uh, tree <laughs> with the same roots. Uh, and it's called Brothers. And then mm -hmm. on the facing page, uh, Bodin did a, a drawing of, uh, of a tank coming straight forward with sort of mud flying off. You can tell it's moving quickly and in and in front of it is a figure seated in a lotus position. Um, and that's titled Brothers Two. Mm. Um, and it seems like in that case the the implicate there are lots of implications to it, but uh, that inside the tank there's a brother that hasn't yet recognized uh, the kinship and mm -hmm. Um, uh, and that was also the period, I mean, the lotus, the person in the lotus position evokes uh, those who, including some of Nathan's own order, who were uh, Buddhists who were immolating themselves as right. acts of purification and uh, protest against the war. And, right. uh, and in so many ways, I think that uh, was a gift. I mean, Dan and Nathan talked about uh, uh, self-immolation. Their book, the book of their conversations, "The Raft Is Not the Shore." Self-immolation is the central chapter, and of course, Dan was influenced by, deeply touched, and by folks here in his own country who, in our country, who. Uh, also did such okay. acts out of different yeah. traditions, but including a young Catholic worker named Roger Laporte. Uh, mm. Um, mm. And, uh, and, and in some ways that those actions, I think for the Buddhists also represented a kind of uh, the freedom to die, the freedom to make your life uh, a gift and a light uh, to a wider community invoking that same kind of freedom underneath everything you know that you yeah. do you know the freedom to be able to make everything a, a gift uh, to community to movement to the struggle and and how that can be so profoundly transformative right that that gift actually creates more action right that gift actually draws us into in a way it, it draws us away from complacent complacency and into right into this transformative work right in a way that that allows us to understand understand our own freedom right in light of the the in this enveloping darkness that can can take over us but actually we can find a much more creative and nonviolent way right and actually absolutely transformative way towards that liberation um and that how we can we we can witness other traditions in this way right and how that clarifies at least for me, clarifies how in my own tradition, I need to remember and remind myself how to lean into the teachings and leaning mm. into um, uh, the actions that are connected to those teachings, right? right. That, right. That, that those teachings aren't meant just to be words on a page, but they are meant to be enlivened in our lives, that, that, that we, our bodies, become a space, right? Um, mm um for that transformation and as you were speaking i was like this is this is what inspires me about this work that you've been doing for many years but how that inspires all of us who are who are maybe just emerging into this work or just who have been going through this work and getting 
exhausted or tired, right? It gives us a sense of, wait, there, there are beautiful um, and powerful, not examples, but ways of living, right? <laughs> the, the, these sort of how, mm-hmm. how our ancestors and guides have supported us in ways of living and being mm. in this world so that mm. we can remember each other's belonging to humanize and rehumanize consistently be in that renewal of humanization right as 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 a mitigation to the dehumanizing right. forces of the of the powers that that it reminds us that we are part of the same root of the tree of life, right? Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. that as we may come into opposition, that in reality, right? How do we remem- remember, like reconstitute, right? In that renewal that we actually belong with each other and in this world, that, that that's part of our larger, mm-hmm. you know, sacred ecosystem that we're part of, right? That, mm-hmm. that that it's our belongingness and our hum, you know, rehumanizing almost way that that where we find such dehumanization. But in that space of of humanizing, that that we reanimate also our relationship to um, God's creation, right? The creation of the sacred. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've appreciated just hearing and listening and learning again over again. I feel like. I want to sort of just be in presence with you all the time, Bill, because in a way this reminds me of the work. Why, why, why we're called, why I'm called uh, to do this work um, mm. and why you've continued to do this work um, and continue to inspire uh, many people, not only in your community, but beyond. Um, and so I really appreciate this time with you, Bill. Um, and I, I want to, I know we are at time right now, but I just wanted to uh, thank you for your insights and your reminder and your inspiration to each of us of this work. Um, and I'm inviting folks to uh, to connect with your work. Um, is, are there ways that people can connect with you or uh, ways that people can learn from your history, your work. I know we've only touched on the tip of the iceberg of what you've navigated through in your life, but are mm-hmm. there ways that people can can continue to learn from you and continue to learn from your experience? That yeah, we can uh, you mentioned earlier uh, a website. I do have a website, BillWileyKellerman.org, yes. I think it is. Um, and it has a hyphen in between Wiley and Kellerman, which people say is a bad idea. Uh, dot com. That's, um, and yeah, there would there would be connection to books and articles and videos there. Um, uh, yeah, and I've written, yeah, I've written about the powers for a long time, mostly shorter, focused things related to particular struggles and those all got gathered up in a in a book called principalities in particular uh the fortress uh published walter's uh publisher uh, uh, and that would be another way into some of this material as well i i'm very happy with the berrigan book and get grateful that you mentioned that celebrant's flame well, I can't wait to be reading it. I just like I like I mentioned to you before. I've just ordered it, and I'm like I'm anxious to get back to the United States to read this book. But I do. I want to do a pitch on your your fortress book as well. I feel like uh, the principalities in particular um, uh, is just a a, a powerful uh, contribution to this ongoing work that you're doing with this theology of the powers. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping we can have, we can continue to have this, these conversations, Bill, because I, I, I feel like the, the work I do, at least in, in a very positivist, biomedically driven, public health oriented world, which is so materialist and so so based in evidence, right? This this uh, the sort of human created evidence um, mm-hmm. that has been a powerful force in transforming the health and well being of people, but it doesn't fully connect to, like deeply connect to, um, the transformative power of spirit, of spirituality, of mm-hmm. of of theology and divinity. Um, uh, this work of liturgical action that animates 
and is in in um, in partnership with right uh, the work that I have been doing for many years, but can more deeply benefit and be even more trans transformative mm -hmm. and continue to humanize and engage with the ecosystems that we're part of. Um, so I, I, I hope that this is not the end for us to, in our conversation, but a beginning of, of our conversations, especially well, in light of the work that you're doing. Well, so. I'll see you in the next work session. So we, we definitely will. And I'm now, I'm just also thinking of just sort of, I appreciated um, your insights and your history um, in this work, right? That that I am, I see you in the 19, or the, the early 70s, 71 and 72 with Dr. Wink uh, getting arrested, um, but also your work in Detroit and, and everything in between. Um, and I just, I'm thankful for your model as I am thankful for Jesus as a model in my life. I appreciated that you, you have lifted up the gospels. Um, and have lifted up uh, the the works of Jesus um, and gotten to the core of our values and our beliefs um, in Christianity. So thank you for this time, Bill. Um, yeah, thank you for the time and for for your work with uh, FLR and furthering Walter's uh, legacy and uh, influence and uh, transforming power of his of his writing as well. Thanks so much. We are doing this together and I'm looking forward to doing this more. So, uh, and I hope our paths will cross sooner than later. So yep. thank you for this time, Bill. I appreciate it.